Hello. Hi. Hi. Good morning and welcome to Hillcliff Church Sunday service online. And it's Sunday the 14th of February. Which is Valentine's Day. So happy Valentine's Day to everybody. Yeah, happy Valentine's Day. Yes, thank you. Happy Valentine's Day to you too. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this Sunday we start our series, our Sunday series and midweek Bible study series uh, in Lent. Uh, it's a series entitled... Um, a time for encounter, for testing, and uh, for preparation. And it's principally going to look at um, uh, Luke chapter 4, which is Jesus um, uh, in the wilderness, 40 days in the wilderness, fasting through uh, hunger and temptation, and um, which is a fascinating and raw, powerful insight into the life of, of Jesus Christ. Mm. Um, we do want to say thank you so much to the church family for... Um, really significant financial donations that have come in over the last couple of weeks to help um, flood the victims in Warrington, um, as well as a lot of uh, food and toiletries and clothing donations that have come in, which we've been able to forward to um, Bethany Church, to King's Church, and to um, Urban Church as well. Uh, Urban, of course, was themselves flooded, so uh, financial support is also helping them, as well as their community and these churches are doing an incredible job really compassionate work in helping flood victims locally to them in in Warrington so it's our privilege to partner um, with them um, so we hope you enjoy the service today um, and uh, today we kicked off with an introduction to um, to this Lent series I just pray that God will bless you as you watch the service today let's just pray as we um, begin our service Father, um, I just want to thank you so much for your son, Jesus. Mm. I want to thank you for this plan that you had, um, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, to bless us with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, his humanity, um, his presence. Um, and uh, uh, Lord Jesus, we rely on your presence right now, the presence that has been promised to us through your resurrected body through the promise of the resurrection to us, through the deposit of the Holy Spirit, our real and present friend and counsellor. Um, we rely on you, God. We rely mm -hmm. on you for everything that you have promised to us. We put our hope in you. We put our faith in you today. Lord, would you bless us as we spend time together? Um, may we be united in the Holy Spirit. May we experience the presence and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Um, our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our hope for eternity that is made real in our present circumstances. Mm. Lord, we pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
Jesus. Come near to us now, Good Shepherd. Come near to those who are feeling like the silence is falling around. You can't hear a good and sympathetic voice. Those that are in deep valleys of grief and pain and hurt, hold on to them, Lord. You are a good, good shepherd. Good shepherd, Lord, restore their soul. The Lord is your shepherd. He restores your soul. He restores my soul. This is true, Lord Jesus. This is true, good shepherd. The Lord is your shepherd. He restores your soul. Thank you. Thank you, good shepherd. May your peace be with us today. Hi. Um, through our Sundays in Lent, uh, we're going to look at the um, principally chapter four of Luke's gospel. Um, as I was looking at that this week, I had a real sense. It's such a raw and powerful passage. It's it's an insight into the uh, into the heart and soul of Jesus, um, and uh, Jesus lets us in. He takes us into the private place in the wilderness and the desert. Um, and I had a real sense that. As I was reading this, it was almost like God was saying, Stuart, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. Mm. Um, you, you get a privilege to um, to look at Jesus in such an intimate way, in such a, a raw and exposed kind of way, um, where it's a moment of, of privacy, but through the Holy Spirit, we get to see something of how majestic our Lord Jesus is. Um, we start our reading in Luke chapter 3, just for context, and... Um, uh, it starts with Jesus' baptism. Let's read it together. Verse 27. When all the people were being baptised, Jesus was baptised too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old, when he began his ministry. And uh, then there's the genealogy uh, of Jesus. And in chapter four, verse one, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And at the end of them, he was hungry. And uh, we're gonna stop there today. Um, today's uh, mainly an introduction, but it's very significant because um, I was looking at these these verses um, this week and some questions came to my mind, um, principally because the person of the Holy Spirit is mentioned so often in these verses. So some of the questions that I'd hope to sort of just uh, explore a little bit today are these. What is the significance of Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit in this passage? Uh, why did Jesus need to be filled with the Spirit? He is, after all, the Son of God. He is God himself. Why did the Spirit lead Jesus into the wilderness? And why did Jesus choose to fast, to not eat and go hungry for 40 days? And what can we learn from this, this passage, these few verses? Um, you remember when, around the time of Jesus' birth, his incarnation, the Holy Spirit is, is there often, also mentioned very often. Uh, it says in Luke chapter 1 that Gabriel said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And, uh, and so the child that's born will be called the Son of God. In Matthew 1, Mary was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit, it says. And that which has been conceived of her is of the Holy Spirit. And... Um, the description of Jesus' incarnation is, is literally saturated with lots and lots of references to the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and here, at this major transition of Jesus' adult life, it says he was about 30 years old, when he was 30 years old. Um, and it actually says um, he began his ministry. 
And that's a very significant juncture um, in, in Jesus' life. Um, this, this, up to that point, Jesus had done no preaching, as far as we can tell. He performed no miracles, and, uh, except for the fact that um, he, was, he was morally uh, righteous and perfect. He had lived what you would describe as a rather normal family, domestic um, life, working life. But now was the time, now was the right time for this key transition at 30 years old for Jesus and his ministry. And, um, and it's no surprise that the Holy Spirit is, is mentioned. The Holy Spirit saturates um, this transition as well. Just in a bit of an overview of chapters three and four that we're going to study over the next six weeks. Um, it says that in Jesus' baptism, that the Holy Spirit descended on him uh, in bodily form like a dove. And, um, and then into chapter four, we read there that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, is, is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And then in chapter four, verse 14, um, we see that Jesus returns to Galilee, it says, in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spreads to the surrounding districts. And then in verse 18, in the, in the synagogue, Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor and so on. And that very famous, very famous um, kind of um, uh, personalisation of the prophecy from, from Isaiah, the anointed one. The one who is filled and anointed by the Holy Spirit um, has come as Jesus' declaration. But what is going on here? What does it mean that Jesus was, was filled with the Spirit? Why did Jesus need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Now, it wasn't clearly in, in terms of personal righteousness, uh, like we need the Holy Spirit to... Um, uh, to make us to make us righteous, Jesus was morally righteously perfect, but it was to equip him and to lead him in his ministry with the supernatural power that he would be, he would require for his work for his ministry, as it says in in uh, Luke chapter three, and the Spirit would also come to comfort him and protect him against the enemies. Um, fierce opposition which starts uh, immediately and, and just as I say these words um, just just let's take on board if if for his ministry Jesus needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit that he might be led by God that he might be empowered by God that he might be comforted and protected against the evil one by the Holy Spirit how much more do we how much more do we need the filling of the Holy Spirit uh, every day in our lives that we might serve the Lord and, uh, and be protected from the evil one in the spiritual battle that we have now entered? And it was in the Spirit's power that Jesus performs signs and wonders. It was in the Spirit's power that he cast out demons. It was in the Spirit's power that he proclaimed the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God come on earth as it is in heaven, just as he was directed by the Father's will and the Spirit's leading. And, uh, and that's an incredible, that's an incredible thing to sort of just consider, the equipping, the empowering for the ministry of Jesus by the person of the Holy Spirit. No surprise the Holy Spirit is mentioned so often at this juncture in Jesus' ministry. When the Son of God became human, he became fully human, not a kind of pretend human. And as a man, he overcame sin and Satan and death and hell and the grave. That he might bring overcoming victory and salvation to humans uh, like him. Thank you, Lord. And uh, because of this, Christ's humanity, um, and because of Christ's humanity, he, he needed uh, the power and the protection uh, of the Holy Spirit. And Christ's inseparable companion through his earthly ministry as a human man was the Holy Spirit. And therefore, not only all the major events of Jesus' life, but through every day of his life, he walked in companionship with uh, the person of the Holy Spirit. 
uh, Hugh Morton, who's a 19th century commentator, it's a, it's an old commentator. Um, he he said Jesus placed himself therefore in a position of weakness and infirmity, a position of absolute dependence on God as a human man, and uh, and that makes reference, of course, to um, Philippians chapter two, where um, where Jesus set aside his um, his glory, the divine glory, and became fully human, um, dependent on the will of the Father, and the the nearness and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And uh, he, he leads the way for us in seeing how to live life um, as, a, as a child of God, as a son of God. And so Jesus came uh, sent, but also came humbly, voluntarily, uh, on a mission, the mission of God, to seek and save the lost and to deliver us into a righteous relationship with him. Uh, and that required the overcoming uh, of the enemy and the power of the Spirit. And uh, when the time for Jesus' ministry was come, uh, the Holy Spirit empowered Jesus to fulfil that mission. And uh, in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, the Apostle Peter says, You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Amen. Amen. It's just a beautiful insight into uh, the mystery of God. Uh, so we come to the scene where uh, Jesus is baptised in the Jordan by John the Baptist. Um, as John baptised people, um, he was anticipating one who would come, who would be anointed and filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. It says in Luke chapter 3 verse 16, um, John the Baptist speaking, he says, As for me, I baptise you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to untie his, his sandals. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John the Baptist is anticipating um, someone who would come, the Messiah who would come, who would be uniquely anointed and empowered by the Spirit of God. One who had the authority, indeed, to anoint others with that same Holy Spirit as he would form and shape and extend his kingdom of righteousness and peace. And that's what John the Baptist was preparing people to, to receive. Um, this coming of the Messiah, the one who was anointed by God, filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, John the Baptist was a, uh, was a prophet. Uh, he was someone who was, in a sense, leading a, a renewal movement by the Jordan River. That, that Jordan River is very significant. I'll t talk about that in just a second. Um, this baptism that John baptised with was a baptism of dedication, a renewal before the Lord, um, where people repented of their sin and prepared themselves spiritually to receive God's new kingdom and God's Messiah. Um, and, and John's prophetic insight was that the time was at hand for this to come. And Israel, you'll remember, had come to inherit the promised land by crossing through the River Jordan. It was a very significant moment of entry into the promised land. And God had given them this responsibility as his covenant people in a covenant relationship with him, that they would worship him alone, that they would love their neighbour, and that they would pursue righteousness and justice in the land in a trusting relationship with God. And they failed, and they failed repeatedly, just like you and I do. But at the Jordan, there is a, there is a man, there is a prophet, who's preaching about the kingdom coming. He's preaching about a Messiah who would come to bring a new beginning, not only for Israel, but for all nations. And Jesus appears on the banks of the Jordan River. And Jesus is baptised by John. And the sky opens and the voice of God from heaven declares, you are my son, whom I love. Clear reference to Psalm 2. With you, I am well pleased. Again, in a clear reference to Isaiah chapter 42. These prophetic words spoken long ago about the coming of the Messiah, the son of God, the anointed one who would lead his people uh, into 
for the, the land of promise, righteousness, hope, peace and joy with the Lord. And Jesus has come to do um, just exactly that. And Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness um, is a clear illusion, a clear picture, a clear metaphor, um, which takes us back to Israel's 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. But in Jesus' encounter with Satan and temptation for 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus succeeds where they failed in trusting God and resisting temptation. And this marks Jesus as the one who would succeed in taking the plans and purposes of God forward where all else had failed before him. And in Luke chapter 4, uh, we come into this, this uh, chapter we're going to be looking at through the, through the Lent series. And it says, Jesus, filled by the Holy Spirit, is led by the Spirit. It sounds like if you just read those verses in isolation, Jesus filled by the Spirit and then led by the Spirit into the wilderness, that sounds like it's got the makings of a nice retreat. You know, the kind of, the kind of situation where you think, oh yeah, it's time away with the Lord. Rest, relaxation, God is going to, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is leading us. So that sounds like the sort of thing that you take your guitar and you take a journal and you'd, uh, you'd find somewhere nice to sit down with a coffee and a, in a nice chair, with a, a cosy fire in the, you know, in the wilderness somewhere. And you, you just anticipate that this will be a moment of, of kind of um, uh, blissful uh, receiving from the Lord. But it's not like that at all. That this is an experience for Jesus of conflict and testing at the hand of the great enemy of God, Satan himself. And it is worth saying um, never to think that if you're, if you're filled by the Holy Spirit, that you won't be afflicted by, by Satan, by the devil. That Jesus was right here. Never think that if you're led by the Spirit, that you're not going to be lamped by the devil. I don't know if that word lamp is a common... <laughs> common usage in, in your home. Lamped pretty much means, you know, um, attacked and, and abused and, um, and beaten up. Um, the, Paul, the Apostle Paul experienced just that, you know, on many occasions filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit. Uh, he, is, he is in places and taken to places where he is lamped by the opposition of the, of the evil one uh, and spiritual opposition. And, and that's been our experience on many occasions as well. It is safe to say, I think, that if you are led by the Spirit, you will experience the attacks of the evil one. You will face spiritual opposition, just like Jesus did. Um, and Jesus prepared his disciples for that. You know, on many occasions, um, he, he seemed to say to his disciples, what happens to me will happen to you. Uh, be prepared for that. Don't be ignorant of it. And... Um, and this isn't just a sort of one-off occasion, you know, because in verse 13 of chapter 4, it's, it speaks about uh, Satan uh, not only tempting Jesus in the wilderness, but it says that he kind of leaves off until an opportune time again comes. And um, Satan picks his times. It won't be a one-off thing. Um, on this occasion, when Jesus was particularly weak from hunger and tiredness, he picks a time, an opportune time. He waits for another time that will come again in the future. Um, and please don't think, don't assume, uh, well, I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. He's going to keep me safe from all that evil and all that temptation. Uh, that's not what happened to Jesus. Uh, and that's not what happens to us. The opposition that Jesus faces here, this satanic opposition, comes right on the back of his baptism. And at his baptism, he and others experience a miracle of God. Heavens open, the Lord speaks, the Holy Spirit descends. He receives the affirmation of the Father in an audible voice form. And immediately after that, he is tested by Satan. And I think there's a lesson 
for for all of us here, which I, I'm sure if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you can relate to very easily, and that's that um, Satan is often most active in testing and tempting us in our lives uh, immediately after the blessing of God, when we experience the blessing of the Lord. Uh, your enemy, the devil, loves to steal what the Lord gives. He loves to take away. He loves to undermine. He loves to dismantle. He loves to discourage. Uh, and we need to be conscious about that. You know, where we receive the Lord's blessing us in affirmation, in blessing us in spiritual renewal, in blessing us where we take spiritual steps for him, where we stick our head above the parapet, or even in our baptism, like the baptism of Jesus. Um, it's very often how Satan works. We are not ignorant of his devices, as scripture says. We are aware, but we're called not to be afraid. There's a really interesting um, passage in 2 Chronicles. And in verses 30 and 31, King Hezekiah um, in many ways, sort of rediscovers and reconstitutes the, the Passover as, as he reads the word. And he, he wants to be in line with the will of God. He wants the people of Israel to do the right thing before the Lord. And he's led by the Spirit. And, uh, and he does a good thing, and a thing which is honoured by, by God. And in chapter 31 of 2 Chronicles, it starts like this. Verse 1, after these, after these things... And these faithful acts, Assyria's king Sennacherib invaded Judea and attacked its fortified cities. Straight on the back of this time where the Lord acknowledges the faithfulness of King Hezekiah and the blessing that has come on the land through the reconstitution and the celebration of the Feast of Passover as the nations, uh, as the peoples gather together. Immediately on the back of that, the evil one um, takes the opportune time to, to surround um, an attack. And it's part of a, um, a pattern of attack that we see in scripture and also in our lives as well. God gives a blessing. God calls. God affirms. The enemy loves to steal and undermine and destroy that blessing. And uh, I read somewhere, I can't remember where it was, but it says, uh, just a little pithy thing, um, it says this, when you're in the will of heaven, expect the wrath of hell. And uh, that's exactly what happens to uh, the Lord Jesus here. Um, it becomes a target of the enemy. Don't fear, brothers and sisters, when we are as we are, because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Mm. Jesus fasted and was hungry, it says. Now, why did Jesus choose to fast? He's filled with the Holy Spirit at his baptism, and he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Uh, he makes this decision to fast for 40 days. Um, 40 days is, is hunger to the point of starvation, hunger to the point of starvation and death. And there are, there are three principal reasons for fasting that we read about in Scripture. One is to do with uh, those who are mourning, to associate with those who are mourning for the dead. Another has to do with repentance. Neither of those relate to Jesus in this particular situation. Um, the third has to do with um, uh, fasting being linked to an act of, of conscious and deliberate dependence on the Lord, where we seek to learn from the Lord, to receive from him, to get in touch with his will and his heart and seek his mind and seek his way adding to our prayers, fasting. And uh, it's a very conscious and deliberate way to say, I am depending on the Lord, spiritually and physically. It's a way for us to tune out the flesh and to tune in the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and for us, uh, we, can, we can learn from the Lord Jesus here. Um, Jesus' spiritual discipline during these 40 days is, is one that we can also adopt. Fasting, where we tune out the flesh deliberately, consciously, um, in such a way, for Jesus it was um, as he experienced his physical hunger. Um, you can also feel, you can, you can feel that decision that you've made to say no to the flesh 
in hunger or choosing to um, um, to, to to not do a distraction that you would normally do or something that you would normally sort of distract yourself with or, or, or live with, choosing not to do something that you perhaps enjoy, that you, you feel um, that in some cases that you would normally need, but you choose to say no. And uh, you actually deliberately choose to say, Lord, I need you more. I hunger for you more. I want to seek you more than this distraction. I want you and I want your Holy Spirit's leading and I want your will and I want your direction and I want your wisdom and I want your grace more than what I could be doing elsewhere. And Jesus chooses to do this. I need you, Lord. I depend upon you. I desire you. Speak, Lord. I'm listening. And in the middle of that time of fasting, Jesus is attacked by the, the evil one, which we'll look at over the next number of weeks. As we choose to fast uh, during this period of Lent, over these six weeks, 40 days or so, as we choose to select something to tune out the flesh each day, to set aside, because actually what we're seeing is that, Lord, I want to I kind of feel a sense of um, uh, depriving myself of something because I want to I want to choose to say that I want you more. I need you more. And um, and as we choose to listen to the Lord in those times, don't expect an easy ride from Satan. It didn't happen to Jesus. It won't happen to you and me. But do expect the power and comfort and wisdom given by the Spirit to enable you to overcome temptation. Rest in him, depend upon him, seek the Lord. And just like the Lord Jesus Christ, um, take our, our pattern and our cue from him. Depend upon the spirit. He is a spirit who overcomes evil, who overcomes the evil one and enables us to walk in the path of righteousness for our ministry, as he did for Jesus in his messianic, wonderful, unique ministry, which has enabled us to come into the beauty of a relationship with God. We want to say thank you to Jesus today. Mm. And say thank you for the Holy Spirit, the, the intertwining, interdependent relationship between Jesus and the Holy Spirit with the Father in heaven is one that we can learn a lot from. In many ways, is a mystery, a glorious mystery where God calls us to come in. You're part of the family. Enter in and experience life in the Holy Spirit. I want to say thank you, Lord. Mm. Amen. Amen.
you are breaking new ground. You are breaking new ground. So make me a vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. We're about to begin in um, the season of Lent and it would be lovely to just remember that we're doing this together, that each of us has our own particular calling to fasting and praying, um, to seeking how God is speaking to us particularly at this time. Um, for some people Lent means huge amounts more than other people. But for all of us, we're able to learn and we're able to learn as a community, even when we are distant from each other. And I pray that God blesses us as we seek to pray and fast and seek his voice and seek his calling um, at this time. Um, as we anticipate Easter and we anticipate the Holy Spirit's coming, as we spend time um communing with the Lord Jesus in his time of fasting and praying in the wilderness. Um, I pray that this would be a really special time for you. And we want to spend some time um, in prayers of intercession um, for, for us, for our world, for the church, um, that would lead us into the community of God, the presence of God and the kingdom of God. So let us pray together. Yeah. Uh John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not die, but have everlasting life. The candle is meant to represent a time of meditation, as we remember the light of the world and his impact on our communion together on the kingdom. Um, let us meditate on his power, his authority, his ability to impact our lives right now. Heavenly Father, there is so much death, disease <clears throat> and disaster in the world. This promise gives us hope. You love the world so much. Jesus, you died for the sins of the world. Holy Spirit, bring the world of life, uh, bring the word of life. Jesus, where there is death and despair right now. Each of us can think of stories in the news that break our hearts. We bring them to you now.
Lord, in your mercy, bring salvation, peace, hope and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Ephesians chapter 3, um, verses 14 to 21 says, We kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and in earth derives its name. We pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. We pray with the apostles and saints. Increase our faith, Lord. Strengthen us with power through your Holy Spirit. Dwell in our hearts, Lord. We pray for Hillcliffe, for our church family, for those especially who are grieving, struggling, feeling weak and sad, that we would be rooted and established in the love of God so that we can have power together with all God's holy people mm -hmm. to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, a love that surpasses knowledge. Lord, may we be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm. Amen. And now we just want to pray the prayer of the kingdom that Jesus taught us. We pray together. And we bring before the Lord all our brothers and sisters close to us and far away, those that we know intimately and those that will only be known to us in his eternal kingdom. We bring them before the Lord now. We remember them. We pray for those in particular distress, those that are persecuted. And we pray for those that um, are in a special need to know the presence and the love Amen. of God at this time. Mm -hmm. So let us pray the prayer that the Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed be your name. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come. come. Your, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us today our, our daily, daily bread. bread. Forgive, Forgive us our sins. sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.